few minutes to have our distinguished external advisory board members um, come up front and sit at the table. L let me give them the briefest of introductions because I could go on for a long time. Um, Dr. Jordan Cohn, Jordy, raise your hand there, um, is President Emeritus of the Association of American Medical Colleges and serves as the chairman of the board of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation for Humanism and Medicine. Um, uh, Laura Roberts, who's coming up, uh, is a graduate of Pritzker and now is the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford, um, an internationally recognized scholar in bioethics, psychiatry, medical education. And uh, finally, Arthur Rubenstein, um, who, as I mentioned at the beginning, was chair at the University of Chicago of the Department of Medicine uh, while I was growing up in the department. Um, uh, Arthur is now the um, had served then as the executive vice president at the University of Pennsylvania and, and the dean of the Perlman School of Medicine. Um, and it's a wonderful advisory board. Uh, I'm just going to turn the discussion over to the board. Responses to the symposium or responses to the Buxbaum Institute or say anything else you want to say. Well, thank you, uh, Mark, very much, and thank you, uh, Ms. Buxbaum, and, and all of you for, for your participation. Uh, the, I guess the first observation I'd make is this is, by the way, the fourth meeting of the advisory group. The Buxbaum Institute is less than four years old, and it is phenomenal how, what the impact of this institute has had on the University of Chicago and more broadly, but certainly here, it's clear that it has made a huge impact in this very, very short period of time, and that's just incredibly impressive. One of the things that we've talked about at the advisory committee on more than one occasion is how to evaluate the effect of the Buxbaum Institute's programs. How do you know it's making a difference? And that's a very difficult uh, issue, particularly in this kind of a setting where we're not really dealing with very much quantitative, if any, quantitative data. But, but just reflecting on the, the uh, quantity, the quality, the scope of the presentations at these symposia that have followed uh, each each of our ad, uh, advisory committee meetings, it's clear that there's been a huge impact on the range of things and the questions that were posed today in the in the studies were just remarkably uh, diverse and very targeted on the doctor patient relationship. And I think that's again a testimony to the uh, effectiveness of the of the program and the and the receptiveness of the, of the community in terms of how it has responded to the initiatives that the that the Institute has tried to uh, uh, put forward. So I congratulate the Buxbaum Institute and clearly Mark and, and his colleagues, but all of you as well for, for embracing this uh, critical aspect of, of, of our profession and one that, that is long overdue in terms of the emphasis uh, that you're placing on the doctor-patient relationships. Thank you. I also think this is a pretty amazing uh, organization, and the Institute is doing beautiful work. And thank you, Kay, for your real vision in bringing this to life, and Mark, obviously, your execution of a great idea. I, too, was struck by the diversity of questions, the methods, and a little bit more subtle kinds of issues that we're looking at, subtleties in how information is presented, subtleties in how to build trust with relate in your relationship with patients, um, looking at um, subtle aspects of how sitting in how you sit in relation to a patient may make a difference in terms of the quality of the interaction in real time. So I, I really think it's it's commendable the kind of work that's happening here, the saturation and reach. I never feel like there's a never I never feel like there's enough psychiatry as Mark knows, <laughs> but I will say I, I feel like there's more of an appreciation of the inner experience of patients, and that that was evident in the in the conversation today. And, you know, in our work, that inner experience, kind of the experience of suffering, the confusion that people feel, um, the need that they have for their physician to be there for them, these are very, very important questions. And they matter just as much as, you know, outcomes of clinical trials. In fact, they may shape the outcomes of clinical trials. And um, the other uh, thing I would say is uh, the, you can see immediately the next steps. The many of these presentations made very clear. For example, where, where's our IBD clinic presenter? Did a wonderful, wonderful job. Hey, because you you 
kind of illustrated how with a special population, some would argue a vulnerable population of transitional age youth, which have many health issues, are really struggling to make their way into adult life and living with a chronic illness is really particularly difficult. Um, you illustrated for us a best practice, a best clinical practice, and I think many of us thought we'd like to try and implement that with our favorite disease, you know, back home. Um, I love that. I thought that the electronic medical record presentation we just had is another example where there are very concrete steps that we can take to try and improve the quality of the experience. And then Peter's uh, presentation today, I think, made us all reflect quite a bit on how we use language, how we interact with others, and just that reflective step may make a difference. And I know that this idea of teaching back is one that many of us will, will be talking about much more uh, in our local institutions. So again, uh, really wonderful presentations, very diverse, really very interesting of diversity of methodologies that were used, broad reach throughout the institution, but very clear next steps that I think are very inspiring. So wonderful. It was refreshing we didn't hear once this afternoon the word Genetics. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear euthanasia either, and that was really <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> so should we talk about genetics and euthanasia? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so as many of you may know, I was at the University of Chicago 30 years, and Mark developed his programs uh, while I was here. I always thought I would get a lot of credit for it, but uh, <laughs> after I left here, he did better and better. So the... Uh, evaluation of my role got less and less. So uh, I do want to compliment you, Mark and Kay. I think uh, quite remarkable what's uh, happened in a short space of four years. And uh, this whole development of the field of clinical ethics and in the patient-doctor relationship is really critically important for us. Um, there's no question, despite Jordan's admonition, that genetics and uh, euthanasia, yeah, whatever, <laughs> and stem cells and so on are really, really important. And there's no question that the science of medicine is inexorably going forward in a very, very exciting way. Um, but that's not enough, as all of us know. And in each institution where I've been, where this has, the science has dominated the ethos of the institution, um, patients have not benefited and their families have suffered. And, you know, that's just so obvious to me, and of course, I think the reason is I grew up here, uh, where the primacy of how we deal with patients and their family is so critical. And Mark and his colleagues, as everyone has said, has been a leader in that field. Um, when the culture of an institution changes and puts patients and their families first, and then brings the best of medical care and science, it's an unbeatable profession, but it needs all those things in place. And when they are in place, it's uh, so exciting and so rewarding. And as my two colleagues have mentioned, many of the presentations, or all of them today, reflect the culture of the University of Chicago programs and how it functions. And Kay, you get a lot of credit for uh, not developing it, but creating the climate where this is important and fostered. Uh, there's no question that the same care given uh, in an empathic, compassionate, and uh, very warm way has a much bigger impact from even objective studies, which there are too few, but some uh, in the outcomes with patients. And these are things I think the center can develop and study going forward, as everyone has said. We should try to be more quantitative in our evaluations, even though it's very, very challenging. Uh, but at the University of Chicago, there is places like NORC, social science, uh, behavioral psychologists, who are at the forefront of how to measure some of these things. And I almost think the next stage for the Bucksbaum Institute is to be able to put some quantitative measures behind some of these really beautiful observations that were discussed today. And I don't want to single any out, but each one of them was important in their own right. Handoffs, which we have various views of but haven't studied as well as here. Uh, electronic medical record, which is pervasive uh, but under-evaluated. Uh, uh, some of the transition clinics, some of the doctor-patient relationships and its impact. Uh, so I always enjoy coming back here. It's actually a thrill. I, uh, feel it's a unique and wonderful institution from 
almost every point of view. Um, small but beautiful in its own right uh, and really very, very important in American medicine in a way that some people might underestimate but I think is becoming clearer and clearer how important it is. And you should take a lot of credit in terms of fostering this climate and uh, building on what was here and making it very, very special. So thank you. I'll take a crack at that. Uh, uh, Matt, you're making obviously an exceedingly important point, but I think, at least as, as I view the, the evolution of the, of the organizations in medicine, particularly the financing, I think we're moving towards a system where there's going to be more attention to the outcomes, more attention to patients' experience of their encounters with doctors and with hospitals. And if that information can be um, sufficiently robust and quantitated and fed back into the system that reimburses and, and rewards uh, institutions and individuals, I think there will be a, a better, certainly a much better alignment than there is now between the incentives that we are now being forced uh, to re, uh, respond to and the kind of values we're trying to, uh, to preserve. I think at the moment we're dealing with a system that, that disincentivizes in many respects, like you're pointing out, the kinds of things that we think are important to patients, important to, to physician satisfaction, quite frankly, as well. Uh, and clearly, as, as Arthur pointed out, I think objectively, there's now data, and I think there will be increasing data to demonstrate that this does have an impact on the actual outcomes, the, 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 the outcomes of, of illness and the, and, the pres and the preservation of health. So I think I, I tend to be a little glass half full kind of view of the world, but I do think there is some help on the way in terms of the way this, the, the system is evolving. Um, so I, I think it's a critical question, Matt. Um, I mean, I worry about it all the time, and sometimes I feel the glass is half empty uh, <laughs> rather than half full because the financial incentives in medicine are so inimical to this kind of thing we're talking about today. Um, and we tend to downplay it in educational institutions and academic medical centers like here because we find ways to some extent, not completely, to at least dampen down the financial incentives and uh, put in place many of these more worthy incentives. But, you know, when I talk to colleagues out there in practice, it's very difficult. Uh, and the finance is driven by big institutions, big business organizations, insurance companies and so on is relentless. So um, you could be very pessimistic about it, uh, which sometimes I am, but not always. But then maybe there are a couple of things. Uh, Jordan talked about some. There is a significant movement about looking at outcomes, bundling care, uh, producing value for payment and so on. So there are little uh, lights on the horizon that say, Maybe in 10 years we won't be doing business the way we are doing it now. But perhaps the most important thing is something Peter kind of hinted at and so on, and that is my belief is that nothing huge will change until patient and family empowerment demands that the system treat them in a way they need to be respected and so on. Uh, that's how many uh, causes in medicine that we got advantage of began from patients and their families. And I think as these individuals, patients and their families 
grow increasingly aware of the deficits in the system, they will demand through their political representatives and so on uh, that the system changes. And we're going through that kind of flux, I think, a little bit in the beginning now, but maybe in the next five, ten years there will be a very major change. And, you know, whenever I talk to patient groups and I'm interested in diabetic patients and so on, I really tell them, you know, we can help you, but you need to go to the important people at cities and states and federal government and tell them the kind of care that we should, they should receive and how it should be paid for. And it's not a pipe dream. I think over time, increasingly, they will have an impact that will be really big. So then I think we can feel quite optimistic. I'd like to amplify a couple of Arthur's comments, which I totally agree with. You know, as long as this is perceived as a guild issue where doctors are whining and complaining that they're not making enough money or they're under productivity um, expectations, well, we won't make any traction no. at all. There's another movement which is around a healthy doctor is a healthy patient, a happy doctor is a happy patient, where there is evidence to support that physicians who are taking care of themselves are healthy, engage in preventive health care. These translate into better clinical care practices and improve patient care outcomes. So data related to those kinds of movements I think will, will help us as we align as a, as a profession in medicine, but with patients and families and other really critical partners. And then if you build the population data, which says that if we have improved clinical care practices, we have better patient care outcomes and decreased costs for the system as a whole, we might actually make some movement. But right now we're still in that awkward space where there's a, 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 a revenue-seeking component of the system that is not especially interested in change. And so I think we're going to need to be patient with this next few years, but gather data and, uh, and really look at patient care outcomes and how they're linked with uh, physician well-being. And I was thinking, where's Jonas who did this beautiful study on uh, patients' financial distress? Mm -hmm. I think w there could be an analogous uh, measure of physician distress, right? Uh, or financial distress or kind of work environment distress that we could begin to um, uh, apply and gather data across the system and demonstrate how that relates to patient care outcomes. I want to thank the